We're building up godly men for a better tomorrow. This is On the Edge with Ken Harrison, where we inspire men of integrity to put faith into action together. And now, here's today's show. So Dallas Jenkins, uh, I never thought that I would be really excited to talk to somebody who made a Christian show. <laughs> <laughs> and and you never thought you'd be excited to be the guy who made a Christian show. Right? Uh, I would say there's some elements of truth to all of those things. Yes, I would say that. Uh, but yeah, no, it's exciting uh, what's happening and and, uh, and it's exciting to talk to you. I, I appreciate what you guys are doing. Oh, thanks, man. So tell me how it came about because you went to Hollywood to make good shows and movies and you were like, man, I, I don't want to get trapped into to the Christian world. And here you are, like probably the biggest face in the Christian world now. Isn't it, isn't it funny how God has a sense of humor? <laughs> uh yeah it's it's i can't i can't decide how if it's funny or sad or <laughs> or whatever but i will i will tell you um yeah i spent i'll start with this just last week i was sitting in a few rooms in los angeles in in the heart of hollywood with you know a big studio and then a big big talent agency and um they 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 had instigated the meetings and and were are excited about potential working relationship and wanting me to, to, to have the freedom to do the kinds of projects I want to do with their support. And I, and I said this to them, and this leads to what I'll, you know, to the background. I said, it's really interesting to be sitting here with you because there was 20 years of my life, you know, where I was pursuing this very thing so aggressively. I, I mean, I was meeting with this talent agency and I told them last week, I said, 20 years ago, I sent you like a DVD of some of my short films, hoping to get represented, hoping to have an agent, hoping to be affirmed by Hollywood. I, I used to practice Academy Award speeches in front of my mirror. Um, really? I wanted so, so badly. Oh yeah, to be like my goals were: I want to win an Academy Award. I want to show up on the on the top ten on the box office, and um, and that was my you know my primary motivation. Now that was couched with a desire to impact the world for God. And, and that was sincere. I mean, I genuinely, my motivation to make movies was I, I, I want to do stuff that could impact the world for the kingdom. And, um, but the, I was for sure caught up in, and I think my, 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 my surface level goal was I want to be, I want to be affirmed. I want, I want Hollywood. I want to be legitimate. And, um, and and I I had various levels of success, most of them outside of the system, um, you know, independent movies that did fine. Um, but God took all of that away from me in 2017 when my when my feature film, The Resurrection of Gavin Stone, bombed at the box office. And I genuinely got to a point in my life where I didn't care about that anymore. Um, I just cared about, um, I've told this story many times, but I just cared about the five loaves and two fish that I was providing and making sure they were as good and healthy as they could be. So that if God chose to multiply them, that, that they would be good and healthy. But once that transaction completed, the rest was up to him. The transaction of here's my five loaves and two fish. He deems them worthy of acceptance transaction over. Um, and now I'm sitting in this room with these big time Hollywood power players who are, handing me the keys to a kingdom that I so badly wanted to have keys to for so long. And I told them outright, I said, I, it's just funny that I'm sitting here with you when I got to a place in my life where I didn't care. I don't, I don't care about this. I'm not motivated by this. And it, the only, the only way that this is going to work is if the only, re, the only thing that interests me about this is if you can help get this message to the world and take some off of my plate, some of the things that are currently overwhelming that it might be distracting me from the main thing, which is writing the show and directing the show and making sure that the show um, lives up to what the, 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 the favor God has granted it. And um, it's, it's really funny because I really did care deeply about that for so long. And now I don't at all. And uh, now God's granting this project, the kind of favor that I would have killed for five years ago. And, uh, and yet now I don't, 
it, it, it's, it's not, it's not what motivates me on any level. And, uh, it doesn't make me any more excited than the critics make me depressed. It just, I, all I care about is making sure that we deliver something that plausibly captures the character of, and intentions of Jesus in the gospels. I can't tell you how many times I've heard a different version of that story. The, the, mm. the people that God uses, he breaks. Because yeah. you got to get to the point, you know, don't love the world or anything in the world. If if you love the world, the love of the Father is not in you, it says in First John. And we have got to get to the point where our affirmation comes from Christ and him only. And man, when you start, when you have your eyes on the throne, and one of the biggest problems of the cultural church today is there's too many Christian leaders who are looking for affirmation just like you were. Now that you are where you are, and we're going to get into the chosen because I said a thing, a few things to you before we started. Um, and we'll get into this in a bit, but I mean, the first time I saw it, I'm like, this dude has some stones, whoever made this. Because to think about actually coming up with an original way of depicting Mary, Jesus, you're just asking for hate mail by the droves. And I'm sure you've gotten it, man. I mean, and the show is excellent. And, and I told you, I, I keep waiting to be disappointed. Um, by by the doctrine of the show because i'm so programmed by the world you know you get into a show you really like it and they have to come out with that one character and you're like really why right right you know how many times have we started watching a miniseries my wife and i then had to turn it off yeah and it, you know so the chosen is a delight uh, your take on things is a delight and um you you really had to it shows the art that you've put out shows that you don't care what anybody thinks except for christ let me put it that way yeah, well, I, pre I appreciate that, and it, it really is rooted in <clears throat> what I just shared with you um, in that very long answer to your question, which was um, when you get to the place where you truly don't care about the world's affirmation, I mean, it's something I struggled with for years. I mean, I had narcissistic tendencies, uh, if, if not outright, you know, <clears throat> uh, uh, you know, being narcissistic. Uh, I cared deeply about performing and about uh, b being affirmed, and when you get to the point where you really don't care about that anymore, it is a superpower. Um, it, it, you, mm -hmm. yes. you just want to make sure that God is pleased. And so I, I get hate mail every day, every day, someone publicly that I mean, people have made videos about me on YouTube that are still out there about how heretical I am, how I'm oh, I mean, just the other day, we put out a happy Halloween meme showing a family dressed up as chosen characters and I was told I'm celebrating Satan and they can no yes. longer watch the show because I clearly am celebrating evil. Every day I'm called a heretic or a blasphemer or doing damage to the, to the cause of Christ every day. And here's the, here's the trick. And it's not a trick, but it's a figure of speech, but I, not only do I not care about that and it doesn't, it makes me laugh more than it bothers me. I also don't, I'm not motivated by the opposite. And I want to be clear, the vast majority of people are so kind and wonderful and the stories we hear about the show are life-changing and impactful and, and they wreck me all every time. But when someone says on YouTube, you're the greatest or this, this is the best show I've ever seen or, or this show's changed my life and you're the best, Dallas, and we love you, all that stuff, that can't be any more of a motivation than the critics can become a hindrance. Um I, I truly do want to be in that place, and I currently am. And by God's grace, He will continue to provide accountability and prayer and all of that to keep me here. But I, I'm genuinely just surrendered to the process and to making sure that I'm honoring God and plausibly portraying the gospel and uh, the character and intentions of Jesus. And so that's something that I think everyone can can benefit from is getting to a place on, especially on social media, because we're all on social media, whether you have a show or not, um, where you can, can genuinely not care about either the, the hateful things you hear or the overwhelmingly affirmative things you hear that are based on things that don't ultimately matter. So I just want desperately, and I know you want this as well. I really want to meet Jesus and hear well done, good and faithful servant. Um, and when that matters to you more than hearing it on YouTube, um, you really can, it really does become a superpower and, 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 and God really can use you for things. 
might not be a television show, might not be some sort of global ministry. Um, but whether it's in your life, in your family, in your sphere of influence, um, my goodness, God can, God is so pleased when that happens and, and can feed 5,000 with your five loaves and two fish. Good for you, man. I remember I was on the LAPD and, uh, I don't even know if you know this, but the Oscars, um, every, every year they'd have the Oscars and they would all come up to my division was Rampart division. And in Rampart is the original Tommy burger. So back in the day, I doubt they still do this, but when I was, this is 30 years ago, all the limos from, from the Oscars would come to the original Tommy burger and, you know, Robert De Niro and, uh, uh, whatever, you know, all these people, they would, they would go get a chili burger at Tommy's. And so we had the, we had the black and whites kind of line the the block to make sure we protected them and stuff. And uh, it was pretty funny. And then all of us used to work all the movie sets. And so we'd see movie sets all around and, you know, all of us would be working there. We would go up and get free food from the, the movie right. crews, you know, and yeah. you see Arnold Schwarzenegger over there at his trailer and we'd be over there grabbing food. And it, being on the LAPD was a very interesting thing in so many ways. You'd go from being in brutal violence, shootings, blood and guts. And then the next thing you know, you're standing on a movie, you know, studio or a movie, you know, shoot uh, with A-list stars getting free food. It was a weird world yeah. we lived in in those days. Well, thank you for your service, by the way. I come from a long line of police officers, my grandfather and uncle. So I appreciate that. Uh, oh, is that right? In that way, yeah. Oh, good for you. But plus we both were kids in the Pacific Northwest. So we both are re recovering from the rain. Yes. yes. <laughs> I grew That's up in Gresham, it. Oregon, yeah, and uh, you were in Washington, I think. Um, um, yeah, my my parents were. They, I was born like right right as they left. So, oh, is that right? Experience. Okay, well, yeah, you I didn't, didn't get to experience really, like you did. You didn't experience the gray and the dark and the rain like, uh, like I did. Correct. So, um, we we talked, and I'll just kind of go into this now again. You know, I probably had at least ten people. I mean, a lot of people tell me you got to watch The Chosen. And we noticed this during season one. And I'm like, I, I have watched more Christian movies and thought I'll never get that two hours of my life back. Um, and, and I'm really critical of, of Christian um, culture as, as it is. I mean, Christian rock, Christian movies. It seems like all we do is chase the world and we do a mediocre version of, of a copying them. And so I was delighted when I saw the first season of The Chosen. And for anybody who hasn't seen it, it is absolutely worth watching and you and you really develop the characters which is again unique to christian culture usually the characters are these sort of cliched paper mache um you know and i, I know you've heard this a million times the uniqueness that you with which you portray um levi matthew and and then you really go into the story of simon the zealot which most people don't realize he was a terrorist probably a murderer um and and you, you you've captured I think you've done a really good job of of this narrow road between the uniqueness that was probably the disciples. I mean Jesus, if you really think about, it, he was a stonemason. He would have been thick hands, strong, buffed out, and he's leading a bunch of thugs. I mean these are fishermen who they were fighting over fishing spaces. They they were fist fighting all the time. Then you got Simon the Zealot, and you got a tax collector, which he was probably more like an organized crime boss. You know the way they were usually were. And then Jesus comes showing up and he would have been offensive if you were in your flesh, if you were a Pharisee and you read the book of Isaiah, in no way does he look like what you expect him to look like. And so I try to read the gospels through these eyes of, and I put myself in their shoes and go, it would have taken some real humility and the conviction of the Holy Spirit to get to the point of believing in him because he was so wrong on based on everything you'd ever been taught to believe. And I think you capture... I'll, as much of that in, in the chosen as you can without having someone come after you to murder you because of your your originality and what you've done, which I so appreciate. Yeah, you're bringing up a, a great point, and it's one of the reasons why when you watch the show and you see our portrayal of the Pharisees, it's a nuanced portrayal. We don't portray them as mustache twirling villains. Um, there's a, a scene that in in season one that's one of my favorites. Um, it's in episode six and it's a conversation between Nicodemus and Shmuel. Shmuel is a Pharisee that we in invented for the purpose of the show, but he represents the majority of the Pharisees that we read about in scripture. And Nicodemus is clearly coming to believe that Jesus could be the Messiah. And we, they have this argument about whether or not 
Jesus could potentially be the Messiah because Shmuel's like quoting scripture. He's a passionate believer in Torah, in the Old Testament as we see it today. And he's saying, these are things that conflict with, with what this Jesus is claiming to be. And this is dangerous and this is wrong. This is blasphemous. And he's making fair points. And it, I, I, not only do I think we're, not only am I trying to give some color and nuance to what took place for the first century, but I'm hoping that like Mary Magdalene and Matthew and Simon Peter and Nicodemus and some of these other characters, that we can identify with those people and including Judas, that we can identify with them and connect with their questions and their concerns and their struggles. And then by definition, connect with their, the answer and their solution, but also hopefully connect with Shmuel and go, huh, that's me sometimes. Sometimes in my well-intentioned desire to, to protect truth and tradition. And I mean, I say this, I'm a, I'm a passionate, you know, pro-life, evangelical, I'm libertarian, but you, you know, I'm, I'm on the right and, and I'm very much about traditional values and protecting that and fighting for all that. But when I write this show and I explore where the Pharisees were coming from, I go, gosh, I want to make sure I'm not that. I want to make sure that I'm not so caught up in winning a battle and holding fast to my responsibility to to, to you know, preach truth, that I'm missing out on maybe God's passion for the least of these, God's passion for some other things that are more worth my time than a Facebook post, you know, proclaiming my my bumper sticker or my sign or my banner uh, in the interest of of a fight that God may not want me to have. Um, so that again, I know that's a covers a lot of ground based on what your question was, but it's uh, it's part of what the show is all about: is putting us back in that first century and realizing, oh gosh, they're 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 not much different than we were, than we are now, including the Pharisees. My favorite scene, I think, from the show was with Nicodemus too. You you do a great job. He seems like a Jewish rabbi. You know, he does. He really comes across authentically, right? So does Shmuel, right? But the scene where Jesus has invited Nicodemus to come and he gathers together with his disciples and they're about to leave as he's kind of first getting in. You see Nicodemus bawling, wanting to go with Jesus, but he doesn't have what it takes to give up everything. And it's that security and safety and reputation and his wife, you know, hey, I married a rich Pharisee. I didn't marry some squabbling disciple. Uh, all the things that real people put up with. And the question is, are you going to give up all to follow Jesus or are you not? And I thought that right there really nailed that, the reality of that decision that every Christian has to make every day of their life, not once, but every yeah. day while I wake up, pick up my cross and follow him. Jesus said, if you're not willing to say goodbye to all of your possessions, then you're not worthy of me. Well, he's not talking yeah. about salvation because salvation only requires belief. He's talking about being a disciple and experiencing all the power and joy that comes from authentic and true relationship with the father. And you really depicted that in Nicodemus there. Like I believe in him, but I'm not willing to give up everything. I yeah, have. That's, that's a really great word. And all, all that you said is so true. Um, yeah. And what's interesting about that scene, it's in, it's in the season finale of season one. And I, I didn't expect the kind of reaction we would get from that scene because most people react so strongly to some of the, the famous gospel stories. Um, this is not from the gospels. This is a moment where Nicodemus, we know from the Gospels that Nicodemus believed that Jesus was the Son of God. He says in John chapter three, only you know, only God could be doing these things. Someone who's from God, so he was clearly an outlier from his fellow Pharisees. But we also don't see in the Gospels Nicodemus following Jesus. We don't see him until, in fact, we see him later in the book of John, kind of give a subtle, disguised defense right. of Jesus when they're when he's on trial or being considered to be put on trial. He doesn't kind of, you know, to coin the term, he doesn't come out as a follower of Jesus until Jesus dies, which I interpret, and I'm not saying this is accurate, I just, it's how we interpret it. It's almost like he's so wrecked by Jesus's death and he connects to John chapter three when Jesus told him about 
Moses putting a serpent up on the pole and people just needed to look at it in order to, to, to be healed. And he sees Jesus up on this pole and, 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 you know, at the end of the, uh, of Jesus's ministry. And I think G Nicodemus is like, now I'm willing to, to be public with this. And he helps Jesus be buried and he, he's part of the whole process. All that to say that scene at the end of season one, I just, we just interpreted that like he didn't follow and he wasn't quite willing to give up his status and his, you know, his, his wife was opposed to it and um, the Pharisees were opposed to it. And he just wasn't quite willing to give it up. And we sometimes can, can think people who rejected Jesus just said no to salvation. They just said, I don't believe, but there's also people like Nicodemus and people like us, you and me occasionally who do believe and who still aren't willing to give up whatever that is, whether it's, um, you know, our, our internet obsession or our vice, our, whatever vice that we struggle with or our pride, whatever it is. And so, gosh, you got me, got me preaching. I didn't, I, I didn't mean to do that. So, but, uh, you're asking really good questions. <laughs> That's what we're here for, man. I, uh, to make a long story, very short, I got sued once for being a Christian, uh, when I was running a big company and, um, we'd let an executive go and his lawsuit literally sued me for being a Christian. And in it, he claimed that he was a homosexual, which he did. Nobody knew that. I don't think he actually was one, but in California, <laughs> if you're a white male and you want to sue, and I'm thinking this dude made this up and he sued me personally as part of the lawsuit. And I got, I, I got the information on it at like six o'clock at night, too late to, to make anything happen. And I was like, so angry because it was just so full of, blatant lies and someone trying to enrich himself off of being incompetent, getting fired. He was a high up executive. And I, and I went downstairs to the gym in my house and I started working out and you know, there's no, there's no workout like the angry workout. You know, I was really hoisting <laughs> the weights up and I'm talking to the Lord, like this is just so, so bad. And I remember the Lord saying to me, um, is everything you have mine? Well, yeah, but he's going to make us look bad, right? He's, my reputation, I mean, I'm known for being a Christian. I, I witnessed, you know, we had thousands of employees. I witnessed to them all the time. These are blatant lies. And I remember the Lord saying to me, is your reputation mine? Ooh, ooh, ooh. Wait, possessions? But what people think of me? And um, the next day I got a call and, and I finally said, Lord, it's yours. Whatever, whatever it is. And I had to cut to that realization. And the next day my attorney called uh, one of our corporate attorneys whom I had not talked to in a year. And he was a, a stud. The guy was an Israeli commando who immigrated to the U.S. as a New York cop. And then he moved to California. He was a litigator of the year in California. He and I were, were close friends. We hadn't talked in a long time. He goes, hey, dude, I'm about to jump on a plane for Israel. And I was just thinking about you and thought I'd call and see how you're doing. I go, hey, you know, so-and-so is suing us. And he said, really? And I said, yeah. And he goes, uh, uh, he started making, he made some jokes. And I said, I, I, it's not that funny to me, man. He's suing me personally. He goes, he can't sue you personally. What are you talking about? He goes, you're identified by the company. How do you not know that? I go, well, no one sued me personally before. He goes, you're an idiot. I'm going to Israel. And he hung up. And I'm like, wow, Lord, you, <laughs> you, you let me get to the point of abandonment. And then you just bailed me out the next day. And right. how good is the Lord? But boy, we have to say, what is the thing I'm holding on to? And for me, God had to break my reputation. I worked hard on it. I, I, I like to be a respectable guy. And God was saying, well, you, are you willing to let that go? And it's so important for who we are. If we want to get close to him, what is the one thing? And I pray every day, Lord, what is the thing? Please reveal to me anything, any sin, anything that I hold yeah. back from you. Yeah, that's a good, I, I, I need to start praying that daily more often. I mean, I, I, uh, you know, it's on my heart, um, but I, I, it needs to be, needs to be daily. And so that's a good, good word that I'm, I'm going to, I'm going it's, it's to take, man. but um, for me, <laughs> I only have to mean scale, it. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, <laughs> right. But on a large scale, that's what happened to me in 2017, um, where you know God took away everything that I had worked for, and and I had thought I was doing it for Him. I mean, it was the resurrection, of Gavin Stone. Um, even though it didn't succeed at the box office, um, I'm proud of the film, and 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 it has a great message that that have impacted, has impacted a lot of people. Um, I wasn't doing something wrong. That movie wasn't like, you know, God was making it fail so that people could be protected from it. It wasn't anything like that. It was my, my heart was not truly his. Mm. Um, I thought it was, 
Um, but it, I, he, he really didn't have all of my heart and, um, and he needed to, you know, to get my attention. And, uh, and I hope that you who, you know, if you're listening or watching that, you know, you'll probably go through something like that. If you haven't gone through it already, just seems to be part of the process of, of being a believer. But I do hope that you can learn the, the lesson without having to go through as much pain maybe as I did or, or Ken did or whoever. But I mean, it's, you know, if you can get to that point earlier where you're truly surrendered, uh, it, it really is a beautiful place to be. Today's episode is brought to you through the generosity of Waterstone. For nearly 40 years, Waterstone has assisted givers in supporting their favorite charities like Promise Keepers by crafting customized, innovative giving solutions. Waterstone gift strategists stand ready to create your personalized charitable plan, utilizing business interests, real estate, appreciated assets, charitable trusts, giving funds, and more. These donor-specific giving strategies allow givers to bypass capital gains taxes, receive a fair market value charitable deduction, and have tax-free growth for years to come. Prioritize income, minimize taxes, and optimize your giving with Waterstone. Find out how to give and receive the most from your assets by visiting www.waterstone.org. Sometimes Mondays require a little pick-me-up. And let's be real, we could all use some help to start our days better. Because life moves pretty fast, we need to make every moment count. Even when we're on the go, we still have a drive to be better husbands, better fathers, better friends, better men. But we can't do it alone. Our Promise Keepers app is packed with a wealth of resources, including daily devotionals, encouraging podcasts, healthy community, and so much more, all in the palm of your hand. Join our community today. I think there's a reason why one of the first things Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount is, blessed are those who mourn. I really do. I think that we all have to get to the point of mourning our inadequacy and who we are, and then that can lead us to the beautiful grace and love of Jesus, because that's what leads us from the guys writing you hate mail. I want to ask you a couple of questions about a miniseries I've always wondered. So, you know, you watch the miniseries like Yellowstone, and you're like, did they plan this whole thing out, or are they just writing this as they go? Now, yours is a little different, because you you have like a, you already have the true story that you're within, but do you, I think you're going to say, said you're going to do seven, ser- seven seasons. Do you know what's in them all? Like, have you outlined the whole thing, or do you kind of write each season as you go and say, well, you know, and hopefully, I hope Jesus doesn't die at the end. That would, you know, it'd be a bummer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so there's a show called The Wire. Um, that was a pretty well-known show. I, it's, I wouldn't necessarily recommend it for Christian families, but um, the the showrunner, the creator of that show, is a guy by the name of David Simon. Um, and if you're a former cop, uh, you, you you might know who David Simon was because he wrote a great book called Homicide, which was a life on the streets. And he so The Wire is a show that's about police officers, but also about, um, in, in Baltimore. Yeah. 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 And, um, that was actually a show that inspired the chosen in many ways because of how, um, it showed, told this story from so many different perspectives and really took you deep inside the world that, that it was portraying. Um, and that hadn't been done before in a Jesus project. And so that's one of the things that really inspired the show. But another thing that inspired the show was David Simon, the creator said, we write, he used this phrase, we write to the end, meaning we know where the show is going to end. We know where the season's going to end. We know where the episode is going to end and we know where the scene is going to end. Um, and we write with that in mind, we want to earn those moments. And so when we first sat down, my two co-writers and I to, to work on the chosen and to, to develop it, um, on a very basic level, we went to our, fu- to, to our finale, you know, our season, you know, the, the, the series finale, what's the final season going okay, to Okay, That's very interesting. Yeah. Um, we didn't do it in detail, but we just know, okay, we know that the second to last season, spoiler alert, Jesus dies. And um, so we, we, we knew <laughs> that. And then the, we know what's going to happen after that. We wanted, we, we, we figured out how, how is the show itself going to end? Uh, and then season one, we, we, we mapped out how season one was going to end. We knew season one would end with the woman at the well 
and Jesus announcing his ministry publicly for the first time. Um, and then we knew how episode one of season one was going to end. And we knew that was the most important moment in the whole show because episode one of season one is actually a challenge in many ways. If you know the scriptures, you're watching it kind of going, okay, I thought this was a Jesus show and where's Jesus isn't here yet. And none of these things are from the Bible in the first 40 minutes of the episode. Like, what is, what is this? Um, right. That's and right. uh, a lot of Christians don't watch it. Like they watch normal shows. Like some people were like, I was so confused. And I'm like, well, it's <laughs> you're going to learn, you're going to learn just like you learn everything else. I'm sure you watch when you first watched the first episode of think of a show that you love first episode. You didn't know who the characters were. You didn't know the setting. You, you watch it and you experience it and you get it. Well, they, they watch the shows in the first episode. A lot of them watch it like it's Bible study. And they're like, okay, which verse is this from? And they don't watch it like a normal show. So again, I'm giving really long answers to your questions and I apologize, but the, to, to answer your question, we, we, we have mapped out in more detail now each season. Uh, we know the big moves that are going to happen in each season. Um, as soon as we're done writing season three, which we're writing season three right now, we're going to get together and have another one of our retreats where we map out the details of season four and episode by episode. Here's where the big moves are going to be according to each episode. Um, and I think that that has really served the show well, because when people talk about, like, for example, your experience with episode eight and the, your favorite scene with Nicodemus, the only reason that scene was effective is because of the time we took to lead up to that. If you didn't know Nicodemus well, and if you weren't there for his struggles and there for his questions and there for the arguments with his wife and there for the conversation with Jesus on the roof from John chapter three, um, it just simply wouldn't have impact. You, you would, um, you, it would it'd be skipping a lot of steps. And I think that's what a lot happens with a lot of bad movies. And that's what happens frankly with um, a lot of, of faith-based art um, is we skip past the, the, the struggle we skip past the the before yeah and we call it and in, in my my wife uh, co-wrote um the, or the chosen devotional book um and we we have an entry called before and we talk about you know god enters into our before who we were before we encountered jesus and we can't skip over that part and we can't sugarcoat it and we can't um skip any steps um and i think that's what the show in all humility does fairly well and what the audience is telling us does well is we take our time in that before so that when Jesus enters onto the scene, you really can identify with it. And it feels like an answer, not only to their problems, but to yours. That's really good. And as I told you, as an English lit graduate, you know, that's the whole thing. Every chapter yeah. needs to have conflict. And every time you write anything, all the, the kids in, in school would be like, why do I care about this character? And that's what you're saying is why, why do I care about Nicodemus? Yeah. Often tell men, you know, and promise keepers, when you read the Bible, by the way, uh, and resetting, talking to Dallas Jenkins, um, writer, director of The Chosen. Um, when you read the Bible, try to put yourself into the situation because we tend to throw over things. And if you like go to the book of Acts and you stick yourself in Paul's shoes for a minute and you're like, OK, first of all, Paul gets blinded and God says to Ananias, hey, Saul is going to come to you and I must show him how much he must suffer for my name. Oh, imagine God saying that about Dallas Jenkins. I, I need to show Dallas Jenkins how much he has to suffer for my name. And then Saul, renamed Paul, probably doesn't really get all of his eyesight back. And not much later, he he's in Ephesus being torn to shreds over the prophetess or the, the goddess Diana. And, you know, whoa, he, he doesn't realize he's Paul at the time. And I always tell people, as I'm a big scholar of George Washington, George Washington became who he was because of a series of choices over the course of his entire life. Right. When he was at Valley Forge and his men had no shoes and a bunch of them were deserting and they weren't getting paid and he was freezing to death, he didn't know he was George Washington. He was just right. this really rich guy re leading a bunch of farmers in, in a war against the biggest military power in the world. That That's the choices we have to make each day. So the next question I have is, I can see you in the show um, you're trying to make a show about Jesus and the 12 disciples, a, a, a Jewish guy always been, always has been depicted as white and 12 white guys. None of that is true because they're all Jewish, but that's how it's depicted in the patriarchal society in a cancel culture, horribly divisive 
time of judgment and whatnot. And I could see you trying to make sure that you diversify as much as possible. You've got your extras diversified. You're bringing in African uh, people and whatnot. You're doing an excellent job, by the way. But you're also giving Mary Magdalene kind of a, a role where you're trying to bring her in as part of the group, not a disciple, but she's always kind of there. And I can, I can almost feel the pain it must be for you to really try to stay true to the biblical text, not offend fundamentalists, but also kind of make this a bigger thing that includes everybody in the world and not doesn't do the old, this is all about 13 white guys. Yeah, for sure that's happening. I wouldn't say though that I'm trying hard to do it. I, I don't, we don't sit down and go, how do we make a new statement about the role of women in, in the first century? Oh, I didn't or, mean to refer that. No. no, I just meant no, no, it's I hard know. to do. Yeah. No, I know it's, it's, but it's, it's, it's hard to do because it's just really hard to write good television. I mean, it's just, um, that that's just really, really hard. If I had to also then try to think about diversity and, uh, gender equality and all of those things, um, that I, I would, I, I would be overwhelmed. I, I, I can't, I can't worry about that at all. I'm telling the story of Mary Magdalene the way that we are, um, because it's beautiful and, and true and authentic and in the gospels, you know, key moments of the gospels and of Jesus ministry were featured women. It, he chose a woman to, to, to be the first person he allowed to kind of spread publicly that he was the Messiah um, at the woman at the well. Uh, a, w- a woman was the first person he appeared to after the resurrection. Absolutely. Um, and they were his main he, financial supporters. Yes. Um, so that's just really interesting and fascinating and makes for great storytelling. And it, it makes a beautiful, it makes for a beautiful message. So that's why we're, do- why we're doing it. Um, and with the diversity thing, um, yeah, we're conscious of it, be- but not because I have any kind of, uh, social justice message that I want to share. It's because that's authentic and that's authentic and that's great. Like it's, it's really like, I, I think one of the things about the show that people respond to so much is that it feels real and it takes away the stained glass window and the statues and the the paintings and it, it puts you there. And um, I think it'd be distracting if, if, if we violate the authenticity of that. And um, I think that the Jewishness of it, and the, the the diversity of it, Capernaum was a melting pot. It was a, a trade. It was a, it was a key part of a trade route. So you had people from all over the world, and and so um, yes, we consciously do it. But it's not. It's for no other reason than yeah, we need this to look like Capernaum. We need this to look like first century Israel. Um, and that makes it really fun, and it makes I, I believe it makes for better television. So you're just telling the story totally authentically. You're not worried about who you. I could I love care that. less. I mean, I I've been called. Here's what's so funny: I, my my wife and I are actually going to do a video sometime in the near future where we read our our most extreme hate comments. Um, <laughs> it's, 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 it's just because it's really fun. I but can't wait really, to see those. Oh yeah, no, it's great. And we post a, we post one every week on our social media, and then make some kind of funny response to it because um, we just lean into it. It's just really fun. But one of the things that we're going to be doing in this video is it's so fun to read. I've been told you know, this show is woke and all this feminist nonsense that you're trying to propagate and you're, you know, uh, liberal bowing to your knee to Hollywood and and social justice. And then I've been told we're, you know, typical right wing Trump voting, you know, uh, anti homophobic or uh, racist or whatever. Um, So, you know, I've never, I've just, it's so funny because I'm like, wow, I've never been called a liberal before. (laughs) <laughs> um, and, uh, and, and yet, and, and then I'll see the, the, uh, you know, the, the, the liberals rejecting me too. Again, I want to be very clear. The vast majority of respondents have been lovely and wonderful. So this isn't a complaint. It's just funny, but yeah, I cannot, I cannot, I cannot worry about the response. I, I, we, I, I never make a decision ever. At least I try not to based on avoiding criticism or, uh, achieving praise, um, at the moment I veer off the plan of just making sure that what we're making is good television and and a plausible God honoring pre- uh, portrayal of Jesus and the Gospels, um, the moment I get at all distracted and start caring about what comments I'm going to see on YouTube, positive or negative, I think the show's dead. Um, and I don't and I know not I don't know that God will will bless it. Um, I don't know. I and so I'm just I just really want to maintain that posture of uh, of genuine surrender and and focus solely on pleasing him you know i'm going to be really praying for you and for everybody listening right now across the world pray for dallas because this is uh you know you know um it's true most of the 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 
media that you get, the feedback is positive, but it's hard not to obsess on the the hateful, the negative. Uh, sometimes a good friend of mine who's a best selling author, is, you know, he was telling me one time about one of his books. And he was really depressed about some of the hate mail he'd gotten, and I was walking through that with him. And and finally, I stopped and I go, dude, how many? How many are we talking about? How many critic reviews? He said about 1,200 and he had like 1,247. And I said, well, how many letters are we talking about that were bad? He said, five. And I'm like, you know, it's hard not to concentrate on the five. And um, I remember when I got off the plane one day and I had been on a national TV show and I had said something about promise keepers would be standing firm on traditional marriage. And I said, we're not interested in getting involved in politics. But the two political issues will we will stand against abortion because how can I tell men to be courageous and stand for justice if they're standing by when no one's you know while they're murdering babies? And the second one is the United States doesn't define marriage. The Bible does at the beginning of creation. And so we'll stand on that. Well, I said it. I didn't think about it. It was a live sure. TV show. I, I got off an airplane and I my phone lights up and it's just like, dude, have you seen? So a gay magazine picked it up and just told blatant lies about it. It was just ridiculous. And they said I was gathering, you know, tens of thousands of men in Dallas to, to bash gay people. I'm like, please. And um, then I started getting all this stuff. You know, we got to kill him. Does anybody know where he lives? We're going to get him and all this stuff. And somebody asked me, are, are you worried? I'm like, okay, the people who are writing this are sitting in their boxer shorts behind their computer screaming at their mom for their meatloaf. Like, these are not <laughs> real people. Secondly, <laughs> I just keep thinking of what Christ said in Matthew chapter five, blessed are you when they persecute you and tell all kinds of lies about you. Great is your word in heaven. I'm like, bring it on boys. I mean, this isn't real. It, it's, and, and you are earning a lot of rewards in heaven because you're doing something amazing. You're impacting people in an incredible way and you're, you're taking hits for it and you have God broke you. And I'm saying this for everybody here. He broke you to get you ready for the massive success that you're now experiencing because you weren't ready for it in 2017 and 2021 here you sit god always brings us it, growth is always painful and yeah well you experience no, that un, yeah no it's unarguable um that you know when god broke me in 2017 and i surrendered it was there were I, I didn't hear these words but it was almost like he was saying now now you're ready for the chosen um and i i absolutely would not have been back then. And, 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 and now again, by God's grace, uh, he'll continue to keep me in this posture. But yeah, wh I, we, I preach that to my team all the time too. We'll, we'll do a meme. Um, uh, we, we do funny memes sometimes or we do pop culture friendly memes. Or like I said, we did a happy Halloween, uh, meme and, and, uh, and I always go, we, we don't care about the numbers, but just quick, quickly click on the, the number of engagements on this post and you see that there's like 23,000 engagements on the happy Halloween post. And you'll see that 22,000 of them are thumbs up and hearts and laughter and all this stuff. And then there's this tiny number of people. They just happen to be really loud. Now, to be very clear, being in a minority doesn't make you irrelevant or wrong. Um, you know, if, if so, I've, I've, I've had criticism in my life that was accurate. Um, I don't think that saying happy Halloween and handing out treats makes you a celebrator of Satan and evil. Um, but I, I do think that there are people who have criticisms that uh, of the show or of me or whatever throughout my life that, that are worth listening to. And just because they're in the minority doesn't make them wrong. So I want to make that very clear, but you do have to get to the point where you go, let's just remember on a surface level, 98% of this is all positive, but then let's further remember that even that number, 98%, is not why we do this. We're not doing this for thumbs ups and likes and followers on Facebook. Um, we just can't let that happen. And this Christmas special that we've got coming up in December, um, the, the Christmas with the Chosen, which is uh, going to be in theaters, and it's shattering records in, in the, uh, for, for, for the kind of event that it is. And um, 30 days out, it's you know selling out repeatedly. And I had to do this big meeting with the team saying, guys, this is fun. But this is not why we do it. I don't want us to talk about projections or numbers or seats filled. We have got to remember why we're doing this, and it's uh, to make people know and love Jesus more. Um, so don't get caught up in the negative, but also don't get caught up in the positive. Um, and uh, if, if if I can make it to my to my death, having maintained that, uh, I I believe I can then stand before for for God and and in spite of all my my sin, I I. I 
pray that he will say, well done, good and faithful servant, because of that. Because I, I did, in my 40s, shift from caring about affirmation from the world, the fear of man, as the Bible says, to uh, caring solely about what, what God thinks. If somebody is in Ukraine right now or Nigeria listening to this, how do they watch The Chosen? Yeah, well, we've actually made it uh, quite easy, even though it might sound intimidating because it's on its own app and it's not on some of the big streamers or on tel regular television. Uh, but um, if you just look up The Chosen, I mean, uh, we have a website, thechosen.tv, www.thechosen.tv. Um, you can watch it there as well. But uh, I don't want to have you had try to remember a website. If you just look up The Chosen, you'll find it. And the cool thing about, you mentioned Nigeria specifically, uh, what's cool about that is I actually just got a picture of a group of people in Nigeria all watching the show under this tent. Uh, like there's like 40 of them all watching it because the show is free. So we put it on its own app. So it's the, wherever you get your apps, uh, you can download uh, the app. It's free and easy. And if you're thinking, well, I don't want to watch a show on my phone, uh, I'm I'm with you. I agree. But it connects free and easy to your streaming device, Roku, Apple TV, Fire Stick, Chromecast, whatever. It'll connect free and easy and you can watch it on a big screen. Um, we've also got DVDs. If you're more old school, uh, those are available through the app as well that you can order. But yeah, those people in Nigeria were watching it um, through the app because even in third world countries, there's phones and there's apps and all that stuff. And we're totally free because people choose to pay it forward when they watch it. Um, some do and some don't, but those who do, that allows us to make it free for the people in Ukraine and Nigeria and all over the world. So it's much free and much more free and much easier than you might think. But uh, yeah, it's, uh, we, we try to make it as accessible as possible. Let me give you a plug from Promise Keepers. Um, free is not free. Someone's paying for it. In men, uh, we don't take free stuff when we can afford to, to pay it forward. And so part of who we are as men is we take accountability, responsibility, and we make everything free from promise keepers as well. It's amazing how many guys take stuff and don't give. And we're not kidding when we say someone's paying for it. So for us to get it out there, and there is a spiritual battle in Nigeria right now. We have evil. We have Netflix and HBO pouring gay movies in, into that country because it is a moral country. It's becoming more and more Christian. The spiritual battle is going there. It's an English speaking country. Getting places like Nigeria to get the chosen is a big deal. Those people don't have a lot of money. So I'm saying for you, go watch the show. It's awesome. And if you can donate, if you can buy some of the cool swag you have, do it because Dallas ain't kidding when he says that, man. We're looking forward to the next five seasons and let the whole crew and staff know the Promise Keepers is with them, man. We're praying for you guys and I couldn't be more impressed with who you are and what you're doing. Thanks, man. Well, thank you. And thank you for what you've done. You've been, what you've been doing, with, what Promise Keepers has been doing for decades is, uh, is exactly what the Chosen is trying to do. Be disruptive, uh, but, but in a way that brings, make, makes people know and love Jesus more. So thank you for that too. Awesome, brother. Thanks for listening to On the Edge podcast with Ken Harrison. For a lot of you, this is our first time meeting. And I want to tell the men listening about an organization I'm the current chairman of, Promise Keepers. Promise Keepers is an organization founded by Coach Bill McCartney that's led men across the world to a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. Promise Keepers is calling men back to courageous and bold servant leadership. To learn more and get involved in the mission of Promise Keepers, visit promisekeepers.org. Follow on social media or download the Promise Keepers app on Apple Store or Google Play by searching Promise Keepers. Through the Promise Keepers app, you'll receive access to devotionals, Bible studies, and other great articles and video content, and a community to build friendships, lead your family, and become transformative leaders. See you next time for On the Edge with Ken Harrison.